Welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you're joining us live, this is uh, another episode of Going Elliptic. Uh, something a bit different with this show. We're going to actually have a panel discussion. So there's multiple guests, and we really invite you to ask um, what your best questions. Drop them in the chat, and we'll try to answer and pose those best questions to the panelists uh, during the course of the show. So yeah, this is about engagement, and obviously now there. Nothing we say or any of our guests on today's show say is investment advice. This is educational purposes only and really trying to make sense of the market. There's so much uh, noise and hype out there. And um, so we thought we'd bring you the you know two most intelligent people we know that are professionals and actually do technical analysis and quantitative trading um, for their day jobs so they can perhaps give us a better state of the crypto market. All right. How are you doing, Shanky? Doing well, Paul, and super excited about our guests today. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. And I think it's going to be pretty dynamic and um, really looking forward to kind of getting that what is actually there, what, what type of market is this? And since both of the guests have been around uh, for a very long time in the crypto space, I'm hoping they've seen some of this before and are also, um, you know, spending a lot of time looking through and understanding what what this market behavior is, because there's a lot of indecision. It's it's really hard to for the layperson to kind of make sense of it. Truly. Yeah, yeah. There's plenty of confusion. You know, crypto Twitter is full of um, sort of encouragement, if you may, you know, people trying to push the market. Of course, it's not going in the direction that they would want it to go, right, one way or the other. And I think a ton of traders are very confused. They don't know where to go. Should they go long, short, just wait it out there? I think there is there is just plenty of anxiety around it. Now, with these two professionals today, I think we'll be able to bring a very interesting nuanced approach to how one should look at the market. And as you said, it's all educational content. Hopefully, every listener walks out of this just getting some really valuable insight. But as we always say, do your own research, um, figure out what's right for you, manage your own risk, and then of course, you know, figure out how you want to, you know, participate in the market. So, so definitely keep that in mind. But I think that the guests are fantastic, and I think we'll all learn a lot from just talking to them and trying to figure out and make sense of this market. Great. So one of the professional guests we have is Josh Oshowitz. Uh, he's a trader and analyst for Brave New Coin and also a co-host of the uh, LedgerCast podcast. And who else do we have, Shanky? And we have Mike Van Rossum, again, a professional trader, um, you know, runs a trading desk and a fund, um, very active in the algorithmic trading world. He's also, in fact, has had uh, history of creating automated bots, including the famous Gecko that he created, you know, one point in time in his past life, if you may, and open sourced it. Um, I think the unique picture that Mike brings to the perspective is also the fact that uh, a lot of these markets should be and is being traded algorithmically. Uh, you know, emotions out of the picture, let the let the algorithms do the job. You know, I think that's what. Uh, Mike's um, philosophy is from what we have learned talking to him in the past, and we'd love to see how he's managing this market today. Great. Well, let's launch into it. Let's bring them onto the stream. Welcome, Josh and Mike. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. We are very excited to talk today about the markets. So I think maybe what we can do is kickstart with that. Um, you know, either one of you can decide to go first. And then, of course, the next one uh, jumps and chimes in right after that. I think the very first thing that 
a few of our listeners already have asked us prior to even the beginning of the show is what are we supposed to make sense of these markets? Where is it headed? Right? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going to keep playing the sideways game for a while? Uh, let's start with that. What do you think? I'll let Mike take the wheel on that one. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so um, uh, obviously, as we all remember, a few weeks ago, uh, unfortunately, the price stopped going up and it came down quite, quite hard. It was quite, it was a pretty drastic event. Um, uh, it remind, uh, reminded us a lot about March, uh, March uh, uh, last year, when there was also a crash. That crash was definitely harder, like if you look at the, uh, the correction we had back then. And if you look at the effect it had on some exchanges uh, and, and some shift we saw after that. So it, it's not as drastic as that, but it was a, it was a, a very, very painful uh, uh, um, correction for many, many people. Also, many traditional firms as well. Uh, exchanges were wonky as well, falling over, some outages here and there. It, it was messy. It was messy all in all. Uh, and what we really noticed, so uh, we, we are uh, right now like live trading as a trading firm. We're, we're market making many markets, uh, providing liquidity, running a lot of arbitrage. And what we've noticed since the crash is that it's a lot more quiet. Uh, we know a lot of people, they, 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 they suffered, unfortunately, uh, throughout that correction. Uh, I'd say everyone who is kind of in crypto is, 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 is that probably exposed like a, a long uh, towards crypto. So everyone kind of took a hit there, like include, including us as well. Um, so that, that's tough. That's tough. And what we are seeing is that ever since, it's just very, very quiet. There's less flow. There's less interesting trading. We do see the price going up and down. Uh, uh, like there is, there is volatility. The vols are still there. Uh, but it's it's a lot more quiet. Like it goes on less interesting flow. There's less liquidity in the markets, uh, and and even to to today, it still hasn't quite recovered. Uh, as for where things are going, um, we do talk to many exchanges, uh, many uh, you know, OTC traders, uh, stuff like that. So we do have some insight in you know like where do uh, big big players think the market's heading. Uh, and even they don't know, actually. <laughs> we, we talk to any exchange and they ask us, like, do you guys think the bull bucks over or not? Like, I, I, I don't think there, there are many people that, that, that know. Um, and as of right now, it's kind of looking like it could still swing both ways. That's kind of how I see it. Uh, even, even internally within our firm, we have many, many discussions about this. Uh, like, we're clearly not at 65K anymore, right? Like, that's, uh, we, we, we might still go up there, of course. Um, but it's also not super, super clear uh, to us anyway uh, that we are in a bear market now. Uh, things are super quiet right now, but things can pick up again. Like you have, you have Sailor who is still uh, committed to buying more Bitcoin. Uh, that that might, you know, uh, uh, spike the price up again, uh, especially with Bitcoin. If Elon Musk, right, like we, who knows what he's going to think about Bitcoin next month and what he's going to tweet about it. So I don't think that many things are decided yet, but it is a little bit wonky at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, getting easier to be bearish. <laughs> I guess on a variety of things and let me just let me just list off some things that have happened over the past few weeks okay so we have we have China restricting accounts on exchanges across the board Huobi Bybit uh, in various forms including removing leverage for a lot of people in China there's also been a removal of leverage in the US sense in that Kraken is removing leverage for anyone who with less than 10 million in their account basically most people i'd imagine I, I don't think many people have 10 million on kraken but clearly there are some people who do that so we have that stuff going on just a restricting a tightening across the board of speculative activity um we have miners in china that are basically fire sailing asics all over the place because they, they either have to move to somewhere, some other geographic location that isn't regulated um, for their specific type of mining, or they're just saying, all right, I'm done, right? So miners are shipping out of Asia. We're seeing a ton of drawdown in Bitcoin difficulty, and that's a way to measure that change in mining. And we're, we're it's just nonstop conflicting messaging out of China too. There's no like single policy that's driving all this. It's just like, regional and so it's like this rolling thing of, of mining issues that are non-stop uh, we have the gbtc and ethy the two biggest grayscale uh pink sheet funds are in a discount a pretty heavy discount we have cme futures bitcoin in backwardation uh, we have inflation on the way up we have employment bonuses in the us and elsewhere running out so there's just less money for retail to speculate across the board 
Um, and it's kind of nonstop, like Bitcoin FUD about the environment. You know, you could counter that with maybe sailors helping some of this, maybe El Salvador is helping some of this. Elon is just like this madman firing, <laughs> firing off at any point in time and the market's taking it seriously. Um, we have ETH 2.0 that got delayed. I, I, you know, I don't know when it's coming, but I expect like 2025, we might have it <laughs> at this point, but that got delayed. Uh, we have BSC shenanigans all over the place, just rug pulls on Binance nonstop. And we have all these old exchanges like looking for an exit in that they're going public. We have Coinbase going public, Kraken saying they're going public soon, FTX, uh, BitMEX. We have the worst Q2 ever for BTC. We have the worst May ever for <laughs> crypto. I mean, there's not a lot to be like super, super excited about here um, until some of this stuff settles down. And maybe the biggest thing of all is this ransomware stuff, which I don't know if I don't know if many people take it seriously enough at how governments are going to start cracking down on exchanges across the board, especially if Binance is involved, which they it looks like they are in um, some of this ransomware stuff. Because if there's one thing you don't mess with, it's America's oil and gas and um, the whole ransomware pipeline. Just being associated with that in any way, shape, or form, I think is going to create a lot of trouble. So it's hard for me to get bearish on the fund or bullish on the fundamentals just based on on that stuff alone. You know, we can talk about technicals um, and gas for Ethereum is basically zero, which says everything that Mike is saying. You know, there's no flows. There's no volume. Retail's gone. People who got liquidated are gone. They're not coming back anytime soon. Um, you know, I wish I had a better message <laughs> to be happier about that. There's just nothing, nothing exciting, you know. Well, both of you made a number of good observations and points there. So I want to double click on a few of those. Mm -hmm. um, first one, of course, and I'm going to kind of go in the reverse order, right? So let's pick up this bit about ransomware and the whole sort of colonial pipeline. Uh, there seemed to be a ton of FUD that somehow they figured out how to get hold or crack the private keys. Uh, and then, of course, there are some theories that, you know, it was some good old method, method of just getting hold of the bad actors and forcing them to give up, right? Or raise the white flag. But it does seem like, you know, there is some some anxiety around it, uh, you know, as it uh, is happening, at least in the in the Bitcoin spectrum. And then at the same time, there is this, uh, you know, whole uh, super excitement going around the legal tender story that's happening with El Salvador and, you know, the whole legal tender and people expecting really the moon out of it. Right. So so what do you make of these two sort of conflicting things and how much would you think is it impacting the price? You know, it's one thing to make news, but, you know, how do you see it really sort of playing against the price? Is it really impacting it? Is it all just, you know, nice journalism that's keeping people engaged, but ultimately the price is, you know, panning out in its own own different way? Like, how do you guys see it? If if we had the El Salvador news, maybe at the bottom, you know, post March, but still 2020. Then it's easier to say like okay this is bullish in a big way you know in general it's not really going to affect price because it's it's circular it's people accepting bitcoin and then selling it for for usd or moving it through lightning through strike which is selling it for usdt like you know there's there's a semi-closed loop but it's not like this magical kingdom of bitcoin adoption it's starting a conversation and getting things going but it's not to me i don't think that's going to really move the price in a big big way is it a big deal that a country is doing this i think so but it, i don't think in general it's going to really move the needle one way or the other it's more about how the market sentiment is around you know el salvador and paraguay and uruguay and panama and all these other countries that are st slowly getting on board um and the ransomware stuff yeah, something I didn't mention was, you know, not your keys, not your coins, obviously, but when the FBI or whoever can just go into some server and grab the coins based on a private key that the user put there, um, that's a different kind of seizure, I think, than we've seen in the past. Obviously, it's it's always been the case that that's cap has, there's a capability of that so long as the private key is somewhere that is under the U.S. jurisdiction of a subpoena or whatever. So it makes sense that it happened. But I think that was scary for a lot of people. Yeah, that's what I, they I do did. think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mike. I, I, 
I do think there was some some uh, some news from uh, coming out from the FBI and a few people uh, uh, close to to uh, like the prosecution about how how easy that was and how that was done. I'm I'm still not sure if it's that different from if you look at like the Silk Road case, which is uh, like many many years ago. Like as soon as you know, it is clear that there is a server uh, that they have the keys. Then uh, right, like hackers can get them, the FBI can get them either through a warrant or 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 not. If it, you know, depending on where where it's, where it's actually uh, uh, stored. I'm I'm not sure if that's new. Yeah, the way the way I read it, I'm not 100% uh, read into this. I have to admit, but the way I read it is there were some statements made from the prosecution about like how easy it is to grab Bitcoin held by criminals. And a lot of that got kind of got out of control by a lot of media reporting. Oh, Bitcoin's not safe anymore. Because as far as I know, the the, the size of the ransom it was a few million, I think, right? But if if you compare that to you know other stolen Bitcoin that's out there, uh, if, uh from very very criminal activity that you know like the FBI's been chasing for years, um, like the, they're they're unable to seize those, right? So I, I do think that this was just they did some like old school police work and they figured out you know. The, uh, the 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 organization uh, and and the servers and all that stuff, and then they were able to get in. I don't think it's really that much different from like something like Silk Road or so. Uh, but but that that's just uh, what based on what I read, which is not very much. Yeah, sure. and you know, both of you guys, by the way, make a good point there. Uh, and this has been argued in the past, where people claim that hey, most of the Bitcoin or most of crypto, for that matter is sitting on centralized exchanges, right? So the point you think you, you use that phrase, Josh, not your keys, not your coins. But, you know, effectively, a lot of this in circulation, un unless it's sitting in cold wallet somewhere, is really on centralized exchanges, right? And in fact, there is another comment that I believe Hasu made um, recently on Twitter, which caught my attention, is that, hey, we keep celebrating this increase of tax volume, which is great, but a large part of it is just, arbitrage trades to keep the price in you know in sync or keep it sane right so, so I, I would like both of you to kind of comment on both of those aspects of it like you know how much is it the centralization of crypto is that even a risk you know in fact we are seeing celebration of it with big public offerings from coinbase and like you mentioned a bunch of others hoping to go that way and at the same time there is dex growth but also there are all these sort of intricacies where Trades are really just happening to keep it stable in some sense, right? To keep it sane. Uh, how much should one take that seriously? You know, like what does it really mean? Yeah, I mean, Mike probably knows more about volumes than I do, but most volumes across anything isn't legit 100%. And it's specifically Binance, which gets listed as like a trusted exchange. But <laughs> anybody who knows anything could tell you that a lot of volumes there are even goosed a little bit. Um, and definitely on DEXs, certainly on Binance-related products, BSC, uh, anything, you know, nothing is as it seems. And yeah, DEX volumes, you know, we can celebrate TVL all we want, but the reality is most of it is centralized stablecoins. Look at Maker. Maker's over 52% underlying collateral is centralized stablecoins. So cool, but, you know, that isn't my view, in my view, purely like decentralized, right? We're, we're relying on... Tether and USDC and PAX and all these other guys, right? Um, so that may, may make it stable, which it does, but it doesn't mean it's decentralized, right? Like we can debate that, but um, yeah, I'll let Mike talk about the rest of it. Oh, that, that's actually, that's a great point, actually. That's always, um, um, uh, yeah, I remember from, from, from back in the day, you know, we we're all dreaming about yeah, a decentralized financial system even before ETH, right? Then ETH came along, it took a few years and we, we had some, uh, we had a whole ICO bubble. And, and now we, we, we're finally getting a lot of uh, uh, protocols and applications that are on ETH that are, like the protocols by themselves are very decentralized, but they're, they're very, like a lot of the parts, including a lot of the collateral that's stored on top of them is, is actually centralized. Uh, that's a great point. It's a great point for sure. And as for the volume and the TVL, it's um, uh, what I think is interesting. It does show how much trust uh, many investors, including bigger investors, have in into these kind of applications. Because uh, you, you're right. Like, yeah, like at the end of the day, a lot of it is centralized stablecoin. But still, that's kind of like owned by someone. Uh, and, and they're like, well, I have, you know, one million dollars and I trust this little application run by these anonymous developers on uh, on Twitter or whatever uh, enough uh, to, to, to put by. So, so from that perspective, I think it's interesting. Um, but still, yeah, I mean, it's it's just like everyone's just chasing yield in that sense as well. And and yeah, yeah there's there, there are a lot of fake metrics as well, which in DeFi is uh, impossible to kind of stop. Right. Like uh, like exchanges had their own thing. Like 
I'm 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 not sure about Binance here, but um, uh, generally, come on, Mike, you're sure about Binance? Go ahead, go ahead. No, it's interesting. It's interesting. So, (laughs) um, so uh, when we when we look at like fake volume and spoofing, uh, like what how we see it as a as a as a market maker and as a as a trading firm is it's volume that is only its one purpose, which is just to like uh, artificially inflate volumes, right? Uh, we, we have seen a lot of that in the past. Uh, you, you also had a whole uh, whole time where you had like uh, transaction mining. So this is yeah. the old F coin and such, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which actually, when you think about it, actually like the the the, the workings and the fundamentals are actually exactly the same as uh, yield farming, 100%. right? In, in that sense. So uh, there, there's actually some overlap there. But um, so I'd say F coin. That's uh, like those kind of uh, schemes. Uh, I, I'm saying F coin because it uh, it actually imploded a while ago. Uh, so there's uh, everyone kind of got burned there already. Um, that that really that that goes into the bucket like the way I see it, like it's all a spectrum that goes really into the bucket like uh, this is clearly like you know they incentivize the system in such a way to just boost volume and they to- and they attach a token to it and it will just raise the token price. Um, so I, I don't think Binance is doing that. Like I've been, Binance is definitely like so they have the BNB token right, which is powering Binance Smart Chain. So I do I do agree that like uh, Binance Smart Chain is definitely not as decentralized as is claimed by Binance. Uh, by by things like it's powered by BNB, for example, uh, and I also think that they're definitely trying very very hard to push up a lot of metrics within Binance Smart Chain uh, to make BNB as attractive as possible, right? Like you can do a lot of staking there, you pay all your gas fees in BNB, right? These are these are incentives for people to buy BNB, which pushes up the price, uh, like as it did to six fifty. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. If if you look at those incentive structures compared to something like, of course, I, I don't think it compares, and it's definitely not as bad as like some complete like it's it's not completely fake. So if you look at like uh, like a lot of vol- like we think that Binance is by far the biggest exchange in the world uh, in terms of real volume. Uh, as for fake volume, we, we actually we don't come across it a lot. Like we are uh, we, we're decent decent market share in like all their products, specifically on the centralized side. Uh, there is weird stuff. There's weird stuff on on, on many crypto exchanges. Uh, we don't think they're doing stuff on purpose because. Uh, but being a very big exchange uh, that's like uh, uh, has legit volume and stuff is very very profitable. Whereas a fake volume exchange has a lot of risk that you're gonna get called out, uh, right? Um, I, I'm not sure it would be worth the risk for from for their for their kind of scale uh, to, to 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 put it mildly. And it, 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 like it, it's very interesting. Like um, we talked a lot with, with, with Binance also about BSC uh, and 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 some of uh, you know some of the people there that are closely watching and, and involved in projects on BSC. And um, like what is interesting is that like e fees were very high. Like as you as you said at the beginning of, of this, this this panel, like right now their uh, gas gas is, is is free basically, right? Super cheap. It wasn't like this while all the DeFi things were pumping, right? So uh, huge parts of the market uh, uh, and of the crypto space were kind of excluded there, right? And like, I know a bunch of people running like Binance Smart Chain kind of websites and such, uh, just like informational websites, stuff like that. And they're like, well, I look at my Google Analytics and like, you know, half of all the people are coming out of like Argentina and, you know, uh, some some countries in Asia that like, like and, and, and there, there are like, you know, hundreds of thousands of users. I, I don't really know what they're using BSC for, but like, uh, those are the kind of like the, the quiet voices that you wouldn't really see being echoed on crypto Twitter. But there are lots and lots of these people. Uh, some of them are chasing, you know, like insane returns. Some of them are chasing yields. Some of them are doing some remittance stuff. I, I can't really, I can't really, 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 really say what what they are doing with it. But like, there are tons and tons of people that you wouldn't really, you know, they're they're not really part of crypto Twitter. Or they're not really part of the 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 uh, like the, the common English speaking of uh, uh, crypto uh, internet. Uh, but they they are doing do, 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 do lots and lots of things there. Uh, n- not saying everything is the like there there are many many weird things on Binance, Binance uh, uh, smart chain right like work pool scams you got all of that uh, probably more even nowadays I'd say um, yeah like I, I mean I, I don't want to sound like I'm I'm I'm, I'm super bullish uh, Binance or something like we we have we definitely have a lot of reservations about literally every exchange um, but yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Binance Exchange was, for example, was a way for a lot of like Americans to trade on uh, a lot of crypto projects that are out of reach on Coinbase as well as derivatives, right? Stuff like that. Like that, that's a, that's a big thing. Um, and you see all exchanges kind of slowly, like you know, like uh, seeing how far they can kind of stretch uh, the the you know, like how, how far they can go into like allowing Americans, for example, to 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 trade all kinds of super experimental, risky DeFi projects. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not that 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 sure. Like, I mean, I, I sound like I'm. I probably sound like a like 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 a Binance person at this stage. But um, <laughs> um, 
No, they, they, they are by far, yeah. like, if you look at the exchange in the world, like, they're by far the biggest exchange in the world, right? Like, no, no doubt about it. Uh, they, yeah. they, they, they took a lot of space from BitMEX, right? Like, BitMEX made a lot of enemies, especially last March. A lot mm-hmm. of people left. A lot of them went to Binance, is what we, is what we think. If you look at the flows and look at uh, stuff like that. It's tricky. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not all kosher, but, but no changes, I think. Yeah, and I'll add another contrarian view in there of, um, you know, is this different to EOS and Tron, right? You know, we can also point to examples where a lot of the uptake um, on their chains around, you know, kind of that early days of DeFi were people who, you know, kind of felt like they couldn't afford to or there were new markets that were expanded up um, into the kind of crypto space. And they stuck around. Just most of them did migrate towards Ethereum or where you know um, they could continue to uh, to trade and operate. Do you think um, Binance Smart Chain has perhaps more lasting power, or it'll just keep serving to be perhaps an on ramp for people into the bigger ecosystem that is DeFi and crypto? Uh, I hope so. I do know a lot of people that they, they lost a lot in the last correction. So I do I hope all of them will come back. Of course, uh, many of them were on platforms like BSC. Uh, the way we really see BSC is like uh, uh, there was a DeFi boom. There's lots of stuff happening in DeFi. ETH was the main the main place where all the most of the activity took place, and it fell over its weight in terms of gas prices and became unaffordable. And BSC was the perfect kind of fix, the perfect kind of uh, because because right like uh, BSC is actually just a Ethereum. It's, it's not a private chain. It's kind of public, but you know the it, it it's based on proof of stake as far as I know, and there are a bunch of nodes. I think they're all controlled by Binance in that sense. Um, uh, but the, in terms of the gas fees and everything, like uh, they just made it scalable as far as you can scale ETH, uh, right? Uh, they just throw like massive servers at it, like uh, and and you know because they don't really have the decentralization concerns around block size stuff like that that you would see over in ETH, for example. Um, but it, it, uh, but but if you look at what's in the work, like you know, like Josh starts already upon like ETH 2.0. There's lots of layer two stuff coming out. You got a, a lot of other trains that are arguably a lot more decentralized. Like like Solana, like uh, you know, uh, there's lots of layer two like Matic and and, and whatever, um, a, a Polkadot, all that kind of stuff. Which was the way we see it, it was just it was kind of just not real. It was re- not ready enough uh, when the boom happened a few months ago. So we you know when things start to pick up again. Uh, I'm not sure how much space there will be for Binance Smart Chain to be honest, uh, unless they kind of you know start doing something else than being like a a, a centralized Eve clone, uh, right? that's kind of that, that's how we see it but i mean at the end of the day like i think what what people like yeah i'm in crypto and i really believe like hold your own key stuff like that but i say i, I would not be surprised if like more than half of all the people in the world that do something with crypto they think of binance.com as being crypto right and they hold all their money there they trade everything there they use their they have yield uh products they got pools on the binance.com as well as bsc uh so so, so you know they have a they have, they have a lot of uh, attraction there uh, if they're able to get yeah to to, to keep a hold of that it really doesn't matter how, you know, uh, um, so that's kind of how we see it, right? Like BSC really for us, it was a very different type of flow. It was a lot more uh, retail, was more risky, it was more newer players. Whereas all the old crypto guys, they're all like, you know, oh no, we're sticking to like either a Bitcoin Maxi or Eve Maxi or something, right? Uh, whereas all the new people, they're all like, oh no, why don't we just go to BSC? It's all cheaper here. Uh, mm-hmm. It's all better. And we got a lot more and there are more coins. <laughs> you can make your own coin, whatever, right? Uh, th- that's kind of how we see it. Yeah. So, you know, you, you touched upon a couple of points. One was, of course, gas prices high, um, newer players, right? And then, of course, they're going for something that's not only cheaper and faster, but also perhaps places where they can make money faster, right? Where they get higher yields. Um, I want to touch upon two topics, and I'd love for both of you to chime in on that. One is, how do you see chains like Solana panning out? And maybe even you can touch upon Definity if you have an opinion on that. Do you see that coming back to life or do you see that just sort of fading away? Um, and then the second part, since we've been talking about DeFi and stable coins, I have to ask you guys uh, your opinion on the latest implosion, uh, Titan, or should we call it Titanic, right? So <laughs> maybe maybe jump in and uh, any one of you, and you can start in whichever order and you know, uh, tell us what you think. You, you want to take that, Josh? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think, you know, those, the newer, the newer chains, the secret is the dirty little secret is that when the time comes, not a single cryptocurrency is ready for scaling metrics, right? Like ETH 
he thought it was ready. It wasn't DTC who thought it was ready in 2017. It wasn't, you know, Monero thought it was ready in 2016. It wasn't like this will go on and on and on because we continually just onboard more and more people. And then we say in retrospect that, oh, like scaling wasn't ready yet. Right. So we're, we're always going to have BSC type of chains pop up in those times where things get too expensive or, or for whatever reason, things can't scale, right? Um, you know, <laughs> ICP, Definity, anything that has a perpetual vesting schedule is just a VC dumping ground. And uh, Hashgraph is no different. You know, we can go down the line and look at all these projects. Link is still dumping. They'll be dumping for the next two or three years uh, at 500 or sorry, um, 50,000 coins a clip um, at a rate of two to three to four million per month, uh, you know, just continues to increase. So unless there is, you know, equal or greater buying demand, price goes down or does not continue to go higher. And that's just how it is. That's another issue with e fees being what they were, with Doge fees being what they were, the people getting paid to, to clear this stuff, the miners eventually say, you know what, I'm just going to sell here regardless of how I feel about the chain or the future of crypto, because they're just so wealthy at that point. <laughs> like if we look at the the transaction fees, for me, that really put a damper on not only just the usability of the chain for many people, but the ability for the chain to continue to sort of eat itself like a snake eating its own tail. It's like, it just can't, it can't chew itself quick enough. Um, there can't, the speculative activity just slowed down versus the the costs to do anything and eventually you know that supply demand curve just won out in a sense for transaction fees and everything sort of collapsed on its own weight and liquidated a bunch of people so solana and definity i don't know i see a lot of anytime i see any vcs interested in anything whatsoever you know this the sniff the whiff whatever i just get so bearish on the future of that chain because historically nothing good has come of that. You know, everybody was so bullish on Tezos, the, everybody, I, said, I mean, VCs uh, back in the day. And look look where Tezos is, has become, look what it is price-wise, you know. It hasn't really done much of anything. Mm -hmm. So I feel the same about Definity. I feel the same about Hashgraph. I feel the same about Solana. Um, Solana, to me, is just Sam FTX coin, you know. Maybe it goes to 400,000, right? Like, great, I don't care, but it's hard for me to get bullish on that sort of stuff when I when I see just VCs chomping at the bit to uh, to shill this stuff left and right. Yeah, yeah, no, I share I share that a lot, and I, I've seen that time and time again, right? Like EOS as well, for example. Yes, that, that's, yeah. that's definitely a, a big one yeah. that raised a lot. Yeah, um, you know, I share this a lot. I think in crypto, uh, crypto is, is so vastly different from like you know Silicon Valley type of innovation. Uh, you know, which really like you know over there, you know, you got all the VCs that are really well connected, and a bunch of smart founders running around, and they all know each other, and like, and and, and somehow out of that come a lot of great startups. Uh, and and I think uh, in crypto we see a lot where they're trying to mimic that model, but it it, it just doesn't quite fit crypto well. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with like it, it, it's very hard to predict exactly like how people want to use crypto in the future, right? Like if you look at for example, like I remember back in the day talking about ETH uh, when it was just coming out because it was turn like the Solidity language turn complete, all that kind of good stuff. Whereas the Bitcoin scripting language is very limited, and everyone's like, well, why do you even want this? Like, what kind of apps do you want to build? And then they were like, well, the words build your oyster. Um, and, and only now we're seeing kind of, you know, that the actual stuff people want to build, which is apparently like right now, a lot of it is is uh, yield driven, like financial kind of products, borrowing, lending, that kind of stuff, which by the way, we, we as a trading firm are very, very excited about. Uh, but yeah, that, that stuff wasn't really predictable. And as such, like if you look at the specs around, you know, is a blockchain optimized for any of this? It's like, no. Uh, because, you know, it wasn't really predictable. So all the massive teams going around and raising like billions of dollar ICOs or, or token raises or whatever. Um, yeah, it, it, it's extremely hard. And I, I agree very much with you, Josh. Uh, we as Jane for we are actually a little bit biased. I do have to admit uh, we're very, very close to Alameda. Uh, some, 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 uh, we took our investment from them as well. Uh, so uh, in terms of Solana, right? So in terms of Solana, like I, I, I do think that um, the, 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 what we all want to see, especially like us guys here, uh, we all want to see um, uh, uh, actual crypto adoption, where where you know people start using crypto in their day to day lives for all kinds of stuff. Uh, um, 
and 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 if you look at the Solana specifically, so not Divinity, like I think Divinity is not is not it's not gonna be it, I think. But who <laughs> knows, right? Uh, but as for Solana, I, I think it's also it's a steep uphill battle. Uh, but the big difference here is at least they understand trading very well. Uh, that's kind of like you know, like ever since we started talking to the Alameda guys late to eighteen uh, or begin to nineteen, I think when they were starting FTX and all that stuff. Um, they understand training very well. Uh, and, you know, like time and time again, we're like, oh, you know, their, their, their hopes and their ambitions are like way too high. Like no one can ever do this. And like a, a few times so far, they're kind of blown us away. Uh, I am biased here. I have to admit, take this with a grain of salt. Um, so uh, they do understand trading very, very well. Uh, but if, specifically, if you look at Solana, like they're trying to build a lot of trading on top of a blockchain, which, which you know, many in DeFi are saying, you know, they, that's what you want, right? You want trading, you want, like, you know, like uh, uh, borrowing, lending, all that stuff, like different investment kind of products on top of on top of a blockchain. And tra- trading by itself is very, very, a uh, trade is nasty if there are like no rules. And in DeFi, there are no rules. Like, for example, right now, all the exchanges have like things like rate limits and stuff, right? Uh, because if you don't, or if they're sufficiently high, you get all kinds of things, like all kinds of tactics that in traditional finance is banned and is considered market manipulation. And in and and that's the kind of like like spoofing, uh, order stuffing. Uh, this is more on the low latency HFT kind of side, which is a lot of our trading, and that's right. kind of like impossible to kind of keep under control on DeFi. So I see many many con- like similar. If you look at ETH, right, like the whole uh, MEV debate is like it's uh, it, it 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 allows for a pretty what we would consider like toxic trading behavior. Um, which might just, you know, put a ceiling on, you know, how big can this be? And and don't, we see a lot of concerns there in terms of Solana. But uh, yeah, we're also not, not not super up to date about how how they're going to to to, to think about it and solve it. Uh, but generally speaking, I, I, I we will be the most bullish there. We are biased. There's some some investment there. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's all about getting the traction, right? Like I think this is the main problem if you look at EOS Tezels and all the other projects you mentioned. And I think it will be the profit good affinity. Like, how will they uh, uh, build a decentralized ecosystem of tons and tons of developers that all want to build cool stuff? Right? That's what Eve did right, I think. And 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 oh, how Eve did it right from a developer's perspective is the Solidity language, which is super simple. If you're a web programmer, you can kind of pick it up pretty quick. I'm not saying it will be secure <laughs> uh, and that there will, won't be any, uh, you know, uh, backdoors or rug pulls or whatever. But, like, it, it's uh, uh, they made that well. And so far, that's kind of what we've not seen anyone replicate, probably because everyone now is that yeah, but we need something that that can scale. Uh, so in Solana, you have to program in a language called Rust, which is extremely low level. It's a new language. It's hard. Uh, it's like it, it's, that, that that makes it that makes it tough, uh, and that might just you know be, be the reason why you know uh, it it might also not be uh, you know the the, the future there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I think if you look at like the, the Eve has so much of a foothold. So if they do a good job with Eve 2.0 or the layer twos, uh, I see a lot there. And and also I think Bitcoin has a. I don't know. I, I'm I'm an old Bitcoin believer. Like at, at the end of the day, still. So like Lightning, I Lightning is a little bit like you know, uh, it's it so far has lived uh, failed to live up the, the expectations that a lot of people had about it. You know, conquering uh, crypto back again. Uh, because yeah, you, right now there's not the innovation DeFi or you know decentralized crypto is not happening on on Bitcoin right now, but. I, I can see stuff there, especially if, if countries, you know, uh, uh, be more uh, open to, to, to Bitcoin, so to say. Yeah, the but I don't know. Like, yeah. The issues with Lightning is it's just so hard to use, even for me and you and yeah. everyone listening to the podcast. Like, it is just so hard to figure out how to use it just to get started. Whereas to pop on MetaMask into your Chrome or wherever in mobile, and then to connect immediately to everything else, you know, that's the real strength of DeFi is the casino interoperability. If I want to point my money at some scam versus some legitimate thing, like it doesn't matter. Like it, I can do whatever I want, right? Like with Lightning, it is just so incredibly hard. Maybe it's changed since I last used it, but it is so hard to do anything on Lightning. Com- there are some problems. Yeah, yeah, there's some problems like the inbound, uh, the inbound liquidity stuff like that. So, um, uh, the goal, the the overall long term goal with Lightning is that it's similar. Like it's it's uh, uh, under the hood, there are a few uh, specs. Like it, it's it's a protocol, so to say, and you can do many things on it. You can build a lot of casinos or whatever you want, or lending protocols or whatever. You can build a lot of that on top. Uh, but it starts out with someone having a Lightning wallet and a few channels, and and that's the hard part where nobody is, it seems to get past. But uh, but but yeah, but the, even if you look at the ecosystem, it's not quite there yet, right? The only thing you can do right now is bounce money around. Once you got these channels, which are very hard to get and expensive, and and you have to maintain them, and you need to stay online, right? 
Uh, and, and in Bitcoin, of course, they're a lot more decentralized where like, you know, it's very common that a lot of these DeFi protocols are at the end of the day run by like your one central uh, website somewhere. Uh, that's the UI everyone uses, right? And then, so, so, so yeah, in Bitcoin, they're more concerned about decentralization there from the get-go, whereas in DeFi and even BC is even further, right? They're like, oh, we'll do, we'll do the decentralization like at a later stage. We, we, yeah. So it's tricky, tricky. But you're right. Like it's, uh, yeah, it's almost not, uh, you can't get into it unless you're a developer and you want to develop Lightning, I guess. Mm-hmm. There is another aspect to it that I think is sort of relevant here is that uh, Lightning in some sense, in at least our view, is still the original goal of Bitcoin, right? The classic sort of peer-to-peer transaction, peer-to-peer money. Uh, but over the years, and especially over the last four or five years, the Bitcoin narrative has moved heavily in uh, favor of digital gold, right? It has really become that inflation hedge, digital gold, um, you know, sort of um, more of, um, you know, from an investment that is not going to uh, lose value, right? A store of value type of an asset. Uh, so I, how do you guys see it? You know, purely from a price and purely from a uh, standpoint of the broader economics. Yeah, I personally feel that there's a conflict. You you can't be both, right? And then, so I think Lightning in some sense um, contends against this whole digital code. Don't use it. You know, just just keep it somewhere and park it there and hodl and sit on it for ever and ever until your grandchildren use it and they become millionaires. <laughs> you know, like that story, it just kind of conflicts with that story, doesn't it? Well, that's the other thing about Bitcoin adoption. It's like the reality is nobody wants to spend a deflationary asset. <laughs> that's part of the problem. It is a store of value. And I agree that that's definitely the narrative. For me, Bitcoin's job is to buy it and hold it and do nothing with it. You know, for me, ETH's job is to put it to work. And that doesn't mean it'll accrue more value than BTC does. It just means I'm willing to spend it because ETH itself, at the end of the day, won't have a finite supply, won't be mega ultra Uber, ultrasound money. I don't care what EIP 1559 does. Like that's not gonna change ETH currently in its current state as far as just being in a perpetual inflation um, sort of scenario. So yeah, I agree. ETH, ETH is more of a medium of exchange for me or a, a unit of account. I don't even know what you exactly want to call it, but it's not its not a store of value. I certainly don't see it as such. That's why I get shivers down my spine when I see people saying ETH's going to go to 10K because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. doesn't look so hot right now. Um, as soon as the casino runs out of players, you know, everybody gets liquidated. We see boom bust cycles all the time. We saw with the ICOs. We're seeing it in NFTs right now. You know, look at go look at the NFT volumes over the past few weeks. Go look at the top shot average user addresses or unique addresses. Go look at hash masks, crypto punks, go look at all that stuff. You know, people are waning on that, certainly. And we talked about gas already, but that's another metric just to see. Like, no one's here, right? It's a ghost town right now. <laughs> Mike's have reiterated that several times. There's just no volume. I even tried, uh, so I traded this uh, fund for tech and me capital on Enzyme. And I the other day I was trying to buy just five BTC with the fund. And I was getting two to 3% slippage. Like I couldn't even buy, this was a, like a sideways time. This wasn't like anything exciting going on. And um, so there was just no liquidity, you know? Mike's a part of, the incestuous stuff not i don't mean that in a derogatory way but just crypto is very small you know there's there's like three to six firms that trade crypto provide liquidity and that's kind of it <laughs> and it seems like the tide has currently gone out for a while i don't know it's it's hard for me to get bullish on that no yeah no yeah no, i agree i agree with many things that like yes crypto is small uh, for sure also it, it's a bit quiet like i mean i think there are always going to be ups and downs yeah. Uh, in 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 the right like inactivity and hype and stuff like that, uh, especially something like like a lot of a lot about crypto is still speculative, right? Like even the Bitcoin store of value argument. Uh, so uh, they're always going to be upside down. They're going to be quiet. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's kind of the, the way the way it is, and we will always kind of see. There will always be. I mean, that's also keeps it exciting, so to say. Um, but no, I agree very, very, very much with, with what you said. Yeah, yeah, and the NFT stuff as well. Uh, yeah, we uh, we uh, we we also haven't been been too deep in in that side yeah i mean uh, for me though like when i got into crypto 
I know I'm just a massive kind of so I'm a I have a tech background and I uh, read a lot of sci-fi back in the day and then when I stumbled upon Bitcoin for the first time I was saying well this is kind of like you know the the anonymous digital money that I've been reading about uh, in all these books you know <laughs> um, and 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 so it's more like you know I'm in it for the technology kind of thing like it, I know it's a meme but um, uh, I. I I, I, do, I struggle with the goal, the store value argument, to be honest with, with Bitcoin. That's kind of like, you know, uh, we're, we're here because the technology, like, you know, I think the technology is exciting. It's cool. It can change the world. Uh, maybe Bitcoin. I, I, I see your point about ETH being, you know, like uh, infinite, uh, like it will just, uh, you know, inflate forever. Um, uh, there are concerns there. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not saying ETH will go to 10K anytime soon, but I don't know, like the, 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 store, the, the, the store of value argument. Uh, it sounds a little bit like you know, like a uh, uh, like, like like gold or something, or like how people approach these type of uh, uh, commodities or, or investments. Um, yeah, no, but but yeah, you're right. It's super quiet right now. Um, I think uh, the way we look at it, like there has been, you could say there was a bull market a few months ago. Uh, still not sure how we are, but it's it's looking, you know, is is looking like it's going like this at the moment. It's 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 a little bit bleak. Uh, we learned a lot, I think. Uh, a, f- a few things fell over, uh, like ETH gas fees, for example. Um, uh, and, and, we, and we learned a lot, right? Like, uh, so, so yeah, actually, this actually brought up another point. Like, Shanky asked this question uh, at the very beginning, and I, I think we didn't get around to it, but about like um, the fact that there are many AMM pools on, on ETH speci- uh, specifically, but we got them everywhere now. And how, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, TVL is high, but there's a lot of volume is just keeping the price in check by arbitrage bots. Uh, that's actually, this is what I, what I love about crypto. Like I, I came across the model of an AMM pool like a, a while ago, like I think in the 2017 ICO, uh, uh, bubble, like yeah, Bancor and those kind of protocols coming out with the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the AMM pool, right? Like the, with the curve and everything, right? Right. Like you have a, you have a smart contract, you guys as, as two pots of money and it balances and the price automatically depends on the ratio, right? Like, like the model is, is, is quite old. And then, you know, Uniswap and search, they kind of, you know, perfected it and did the, did the product side around that really, really well. Uh, and then then curve and then everything else came after uh, and sushi of course right um but yeah so it's funny because when we looked at that from a trading perspective it's actually super inefficient and pretty dumb way to trade uh because the impermanent loss that a lot of people have now unfortunately uh experienced uh, in real life uh and uh, also slippage if you want to trade size and stuff like it's just it's not a very efficient market in that sense but then they came out with the yield right uh like this is late last year uh when like comp and as an x they, they slowly started the whole like uh, yield incentive, uh, right? Like um, uh, 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 kind of uh, like structures and processes around doing that and governance tokens, all that. You got like Wi-Fi and everything. And that's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, that's what I love about crypto. Like it came unexpected. Uh, it came like we weren't, we didn't see it coming. We were just like, AMMs are really dumb way to trade from a trading perspective. Like if you just look at the trading, right? Like if you take the yield away, AM- AMMs are really, really bad, right? Like unless uh, you you deal with like, you know, like professional quant- uh, professional trading firms, they're able to kind of hedge out the exposure, do some OT option deals so they can limit their impermanent loss, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, if you, it, 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 like either that or you need insane yield or something. And that's what we saw. Uh, and it's kind of like, yeah, we weren't, see, we, we weren't expecting it. Uh, and it can really, and that's what I kind of love about crypto. So as, as for the future, I think it's going to be the same, like, you know, like, I don't think we're going to see like everything will go up again. That has been going up in the last few months per se. I think someone will do a new twist and it will unlock a new kind of, you know, roller coaster up again at some point. I think like, like, I don't think crypto is over, right? Like there will be more hypes in the future. No, of course uh, not. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. when is the question? It might, it might take a while. I don't think any of us are like anti-crypto or hate crypto or anything. <laughs> I just my biggest problem with like crypto people is their inability to recognize reality and like you know I want everything to go to the moon, but the reality is that's probably not going to happen anytime super soon. It does to me look more and more every day that until volumes come back, we're just going to be more and more bearish. Look at 2018. Look at you know anything that's already happened already you know look at post icos right volumes went to zero <laughs> most icos what's happening now volumes are going to zero um this so uh, this is a movie we've all seen before if we've been here long enough and some people just aren't ready to face that reality and they're going to get bulldozed you know so ultimately if if for me my big thing is if people have a plan for that you know what do i care right I, i'm not here to provide investment advice i'm just saying if you are ready to hold everything you own down 50% or more, Godspeed, good for you. It's not for me. 
but be prepared <laughs> for uh, a move like that because that could happen very easily. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent. If you're if you're yeah. starting investor or something, right now is not the time to be buying any crypto assets. I hundred percent agree there. Uh, I mean, we don't know, but it's looking at yeah. All, all the indicators uh, are, are are pointing bearish right now. Hundred percent agree there. No, for sure. Mm -hmm. So we've got a community question as well of um, why uh, the crypto and commodity drop after the Fed announcement. Like, can you guys um, make a bit more sense of that? I know Josh, you had some commentary as well on. Um, your podcast this week doesn't make sense um, for dollar inflation corrections to move the price of crypto. Are we a commodity? Yeah, I'm really curious mainly what Mike thinks about this um, because we've seen so much chatter about the VIX and Dixie lately. Now I talk about the Dixie DXY every week um, just as part of like a legacy review that I do because historically if the VIX is going or if the Dixie is going up, we're bearish crypto. You know, if the dollar is strong, we're bearish. Um, the fundamentals for the dollar are weak, but the Dixie is rising. Uh, so I'm curious, really, more so what Mike, if he has any thoughts on that. Actually, not too deep on the thread side. I just, uh, it just wait, wait, wait. Just said the Fed announcement. Uh, I just. There was a. Um, to be honest, no, I, I know very little. Actually, I'm a little bit. Uh, uh, um, uh, behind behind there so no, i can't really comment on that i just know whenever it hit it was very very wild few minutes in the markets uh, the price really went uh, bollocks which was uh 2 a.m local time for me it was this was a few days ago right like it was uh yeah uh yep. that, that that's sorry i'm still kind of processing the events from back then a big like uh, bitcoin went up and then like two minutes later it went down again like really hard <laughs> yeah. uh, and like and, and so fast like i'm talking like within a second kind of fast it took down a few exchanges as well so I'm still uh, I'm still processing the events. Like FTX was was down for the good night there, uh, citing cloud cloudflare issues. Uh, so I'm I'm still kind of processing the events that came from the announcement. But I don't I can't go into the announcement. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's funny in in the FX markets they have this thing called non-farm payrolls um, that they release. I, I don't know if it's every month or whatever. I don't I don't remember. But um, the NFP will always move price like immediately on the announcement right and mm -hmm. this this fomonk meeting or decision or announcement very similar to that uh, in crypto where we see this crazy volatility for like a few seconds and then it's like nothing happened or it's back to normal or whatever um and there's people who like spend a, their week like figuring out what the whisper is or what like the prediction is going to be and then trade trade that you know in a hyper low time frame um uh, i that's not for me at all. So uh, good for them. Um, I just yeah, think no, it's... That's, it's very interesting. So for us, so we are a mark maker, meaning that yeah. like, you know, if the price is going to move very suddenly, we are at big risk. Yeah. That's bad, but we will get run over. So for us, it is important. And we know a lot of our competitors as well. Like, so everyone is streaming like all the Elon tweets, right? Like everyone has systems that, you know, yep. uh, whenever Elon, tweet, uh, Elon Musk tweets, we all need to know about it, right? And, and, and these kind of, and the Fed, Fed announcements Why as well, or like big news coming out of China, People are setting up automated systems to be able to handle this. Uh, also, also, just from a risk management perspective, right? Like, if if you're, you know, quoting sufficient size in the books, then you kind of have to. Uh, this is this is a trend, uh, and and like we're getting, it, like historically, it hasn't been that trust, uh, fast. Like in the beginning of Elon, like when he was still tweeting about Doge, uh, positively. I guess he still is, but like when he started doing that earlier this year, you could manually trade it, right? Like it took a few, it took a minute or so. So if you just saw the tweet on Twitter, you could just buy and right, and and now it's like within seconds. Mm -hmm. and doesn't always go up anymore so there's more sophistication being added there yeah no yeah as you said just good good for you. I, I wouldn't recommend this to 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 everyday people but like uh the, the bigger the bigger firms they they all kind of need to be ready for that and exchanges as well if there's a load expectation uh uh it's uh it, it, it's funny like that we, we see a market's become more developed in that sense mm -hmm. uh which is good so mike maybe we need an algorithm which kind of listens to elon's tweets and then widens the spread for market makers or, oh, exactly. or takes a lead oh, no, or something i'm sure they're all doing this already i like, could be honest uh and they might be arming it as well right like um uh, but the hard thing is that he tweets a lot of pictures so you kind of need some kind of machine learning to understand <laughs> if it's positive or negative that that's the hard part yeah 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 and there's, there's a, a lot of sarcasm as well right so it's uh it's not easy so you have to throw like the whole the whole book at it like you know like it's not just you can't just use simple like you know is uh, like a list of negative words if it's in there, that must be bad, right? Uh, sell, sell. Uh, it's, it's tricky, but it's it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Complicated I mean, it's, sentiment analysis. It's yeah, clearly sorry. happening, like you're saying, because it does happen and has happened quicker and quicker. 
like yeah, recently. I mean, the, the amount of money, like especially Doge. I think Doge is the wake up call for. Um, 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 there's a very good podcast from Chabuka from uh, uh, Alameda where he talks about how Alameda was trading the Doge on a long term um, perspective. It's mm-hmm. very very interesting. So uh, he wasn't talking about any of the like you know whenever he tweets we you know within two milliseconds we're trading nothing like that. But he was just saying like um, um, Doge is pretty low now. Uh, if we looked at the flows and we think there are this many like holders and long term holders and there, there's this many Doge is, is lost forever. It's a big part of the supply I think. Uh, you you can like reasonably assume. Um, um, and they were like, well, we just, you know, odds are quite likely you're just going to keep tweeting positively about Doge. You're just going to buy. So they bought like a fuck ton in January. They've been quite public mm. about that. Uh, and it, because it just, well, the EV is just there, right? Like, you know, it really can't go down that much anymore because it's really low. Uh, just like, I, don't, I, I can't even remember the, the price, but a lot lower than like, you know, a few, a few months ago. So it, it's, it's interesting. And I, like people are waking up because the amount of money that's in these meme coins, it's, it, it's crazy, right? Like a meme coin is also not the crypto I signed up for, right? Like right. it's not why, but it's, it's become part of culture, I think, right? Like similar to how we're seeing in traditional, uh, traditional finance with AMC and GameStop and all that 100%. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very sad story for many people. Like many people, unfortunately, lose out on this. They 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 end up losing money, right? But on the other hand, it's it's also culture, uh, and it's part of internet culture, right? So, I also like you know uh, the fact that it's not just super rational. It's all about you know what is the best has the best blockchain stuff like that. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a lot of manipulation, a lot of pump and dumps that that come with that, of course, scams as well. Um, but yeah, people are setting up massive infrastructure around Doge right now. It's it, it's it's funny to think about it. People are throwing a lot of developers and systems and servers at this problem of tree you know, trading Elon trees about Doge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the dog the dog coins are becoming an asset class, I believe. With <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a strange, Shiba Inu and Doge and I guess what have you, the whole bunch. So just one bit I want to chime in on, I think Josh, you spoke a little bit to this on the Dixie and the inflation bit. So I personally like to track that quite a bit, just, you know, just something that I've been tracking for many years now, uh, even prior to crypto and, you know, just looking at currency markets, uh, sort of just mapping to geopolitical things that go on. Um, One of the things that caught my attention a whole lot over the last two, three days is that uh, if you just go back a few months, especially after this whole money printer and the pandemic year that was unfolding, the dollar was falling. It was consistently falling. In fact, if you picked any pair whatsoever against the dollar, whether the dollar against the Canadian, uh, you know, loony, or if you did, you know, a uh, dollar versus the uh, euro or pound or just about any major currency, uh, dollar was basically with a bearish bias, you know, and there was no doubts on it. It was, in fact, getting bearish and bearish and bearish. Um, now, after this Fed announcement, suddenly we see a massive reversal. And there was, of course, also for, uh, you know, some of us, and I believe, Josh, you also noticed that I, I did see that somewhere that, you know, there was sort of that uh, inverse head and shoulders type of pattern that we see emerging in the Dixie uh, price action. So there was, you know, two, three big green candles, you know, suddenly now Dixie seems to be right on top and, you know, US dollar is like the stronger of the pack. It's becoming the stronger currency. And, you know, what I worry about is that that might um, in some sense take away this whole narrative around, hey, the dollar is actually weakening. It's a useless currency. Um, You know, don't invest in that and instead go to crypto, right? Of course, it's more of a Bitcoin narrative. And then if you add that and you compound that with the fact that inflation may not go out of hand, which is a possibility in the sense that, yes, there is going to be inflation. Yes, there is already is some, but it may not go out of hand 1970s style. And it might be kind of contained more like 2011 style, right, with a nice growth that possibly U.S. shows compared to other economies. I think that might actually, in my opinion, adversely impact crypto. People might start misbelieving or, you know, be be disillusioned with this narrative of, uh, inflation and hey, the world is coming to an end. Um, any thoughts on it? Any take on it? Yeah, I think what people don't realize, especially in crypto, is that the DXY is an index of other currencies against the dollar. And if everybody's printing money, some places more than others, right? Like we can still see the purchasing power of the US dollar decline, but have Dixie strength if we're printing less or we have less inflation or whatever the the market forces are, you know, whatever that may be. So when I say like Dixie's going higher, people assume that I think the dollar's getting stronger, but that, that, you know, that, that isn't, 
um, mutually exclusive or whatever that doesn't go hand in hand collectively. So I think I am going to have to do a do an explainer on the DXY a little bit for that purpose for crypto people just to say like, hey, like this is what it is. It's mostly the euro. I think it's like 60 percent euro mm -hmm. um, versus the dollar or something like that. Um, so yeah just look at people need to just open a chart look at dxy look at the vix you know anytime the vix spikes we go down in crypto that's that's a one-to-one -one correlation that is a hundred percent correlation um and if people are expecting the vix to explode if people are expecting dixie strength that that is not going to be bullish for crypto <laughs> we are already past the bull prime you know um on several technical metrics so if we have bearish macro stuff like you're suggesting shanky uh which i agree with you know that's only gonna push us lower you know i mean that's just the reality right mm -hmm. yeah well we'll see how that unfolds but i just worry you know and so i thought something something to keep in mind yeah i think people people have like normalized this this wealth that they have or the prices that they're seeing Mm -hmm. And many of them just haven't been around long enough to see us go from 1500 to 200 in BTC, right? Or to see ETH go from 1000 to 90 or whatever, whatever happened, right? Um, and for me, I get excited. I'm like, okay, great, game on. We have another trend, you know? I love trends. Let it, I don't care if it's up or down. Right. It's, awesome, sick. Let's do it, right? Let's, let's go back to 600. I know that's a good buy. You know, like I have targets for that, for this price action. Um, so I, I think when people realize they can, they can trade both sides of the book, that, you know, it's actually fine. It's not like the end of the world. Crypto's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, people take it personally when they see like their coin going down or when I say like Doge is going to like Doge. Speaking of Doge, its market cap is still 40 billion. That's the yeah. number excluding Tether. Yeah. On the market cap list, it is number five. Like, what reality? Does that make sense? You know, <laughs> like it's, it makes it's more no than sense. the it's more than the GDP of El Salvador. <laughs> it just it, it boggles the mind. <laughs> it raises questions about market cap and if market cap even matters. It raises questions about excluding coins that are no longer in circulation. You know, you know what are we what are we really measuring here? Does it matter? Right? Like this isn't like market caps of stocks. This is much different. Um, so, yeah, I uh, I'm not bullish on pretty much anything right now. It's BTC probably looks the best amongst everything at the moment, not because I'm a maxi, but just because it's held flat since May 18th, whereas much of DeFi land kind of hasn't held flat since May 18th. And when they have this perpetual emission curve, and there's no buying demand, you know, prices go down. That's welcome to the economics of reality right <laughs> like a lot of these people who have gotten these these airdrops uh one inch uni sushi curve comp whatever it is um at some point they're going to be selling you know and they don't care if they sell now or 50 percent lower because they're up ten thousand million percent right so they you know they're just going to sell regardless that's that's my own thoughts on that yeah, and professional um, question coming through. So uh, perhaps, Josh, you could talk to this from the Techme Capital Enzyme portfolio. Are you holding any spot BTC or ETH, uh, or is it all in cash and waiting for the market to go lower? Yeah, so we're 50-50 on the Enzyme portfolio right now, meaning 50% BTC, or sorry, 50% crypto. 50% cash um, in Aave. Something else we didn't mention is the yields for all this stuff is way down. Um, USDC yields are down, sure. uh, DAI yields, you know, everything. As we're, especially as we're printing more and more USDC, which every day I look, it's like 50 million print here, 50 million print there. We're printing more and more USDC, and the demand has just disappeared for borrowing that. Um, so I expect yields to continue to go lower until we stop printing USDC, right? For me, the the band to print USDC is directly correlated with yields in DeFi. Um, so until we see some equilibrium there, you know, we're just going to keep printing until yields are basically zero, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, but until demand for borrowing comes back, um, yields should keep going lower. Uh, so yeah, we're, I'm fifty fifty in the, the enzyme stuff right now. 
And Mike, how about, um, I know you're mostly trading derivatives, but um, do you have any spot exposure or it's yes. out in cash? We have uh, some ETH, some Bitcoin. Uh, this is more like strategic long term. Uh, so we don't worry about it like true uh, uh, cycles like this. So we, we keep holding that. We keep holding it. I, I think actually uh, uh, we, we convert a little bit of our trading profit uh, usually into into Bitcoin, most, most of it in Bitcoin. Uh, and that's more like a very long term strategy, so to say. If we're not playing any, any if we're not playing the market, we're not timing anything here. Uh, but we, we just, you know, we're bullish long term, long, long term. I might as well like build out a, a back, so to say. This is a very small percentage of, of, of what we hold and what we make in that sense. So I'm not talking about like we're converting a half our money or something like that. Um, yeah, um, but but and, and a, a, a reason why we keep it that small is also because we don't want to worry about it too much. Like, for example, if there's a crash, uh, us as being traders that are always live trading are already worried about market action. And we don't want to also be worried about, you know, having to, 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 to manage risk uh, on, on our own bags there. Uh, so it's it's basically like whatever we can afford to lose. Right? I know it's a uh, it's a uh, it, beginner's investment advice, but we we still follow through as a trading firm. There, um, I think there was um, oh yeah about interest rates. Interest rates very very interesting. Uh, you use these growing. I think a lot of this is also because um, uh, I think there are two sides to this. One is uh, uh, tether. Tether is definitely like you know not as dominant in in that sense as they once were. And two is like they're still uh, like. Even though right now there's activities kind of shrinking, if you look at the offshore platforms that are almost all stablecoin based, uh, they are still growing, right? Like if people want to trade on Binance, if people want to trade on Wobi, they will need some stablecoin. A lot of in Tether, but like uh, e even, I don't know, even yesterday or, or two days ago, actually, Binance launched a new perpetual, which is uh, BUSD, which is the, their rep thing about PAX, uh, um, uh, priced as well as uh, collateralized. Um the more, more and more more stuff's coming out. I think a lot of exchanges are also trying to hedge that are a little bit maybe. I'm, I'm not really sure what, what's happening there. But yeah, like uh, there is a lot being printed right now. Uh, and yields are going down. I think the yields going down is definitely also because there's no there's nothing interesting to do anymore. Like Josh already touched upon the GPTC uh, uh, not being arbable anymore currently. Uh, in DeFi, there's less yields. Uh, the, the basis is completely gone, right? The future base, even on see me like everywhere. Uh, uh, ABC me was always smaller than it, than it was offshore, but uh, uh, you know it's gone everywhere right now. So there's there's just, there's there's no money to make, so no one's really able like want to pay that interest, right? Like we, we actually we as a trading firm, we are active borrowers on stablecoin through uh, through a lot of lenders and such. Um, and right now for us it's kind of like you no, know, uh, like a few months ago we were paying you know some places we were paying twenty percent a year, and right now we can't. It's unprofitable to do so. Uh, we we're dipping below ten now, right? Uh, uh, for us, this is on the on the borrower side, right? Not not at what what we will see on the on the other side there. Um, it's hard because it just yeah, can't make money <laughs> the same way currently. So that, that that's our perspective on rates. Yeah, makes sense. So there are a couple of questions I want to definitely ask both of you, and one is just the bigger question that I think crypto community is always talking about. Is ETH hitting 5K? Is ETH <laughs> flipping BTC? So tell me what you guys think on both of these. I mean, ETH gets bigger every cycle. I think a flipping, don't you dare quote me on Twitter, but <laughs> I think a flipping will happen eventually. Um, I, like, like, let it happen. I don't care at this point. Like, you know, I, I think people worried about it are just, uh, barking up the wrong tree i don't know like what's the big deal it's got a bigger market cap because there's more stuff to do with it end of sentence right uh or will have a bigger market cap if there's more stuff to do with it if it can scale you know if it can deliver on these promises and have this casino speculative gambling degeneracy attached to it like it did with icos like it did with nfts like it did with Yield farming, like it does with all those things, right? Like if we unlock some new technology that's an old technology two years from now, um, sure, ETH can get bigger if it can scale, right? Um, okay. We were talking about we were talking about treasuries. One thing I wanted to mention too, like again, this is a movie that's happened before. We've all seen it. Um, if you look at the ICO treasury sell down in 2018, when all these ETH maxi ICOs thought it was a great idea to hold ETH. Until all of a sudden, ETH was just 
depreciating day after day after day, <laughs> the price was, um, you know, then they start to panic and then they realize, oh, there's volatility risk. What do I do? I got to sell if I want to hold on to these, these raise, these raises that they took. Right. Um, so you're seeing a lot of, uh, exchanges, this, these DeFi exchanges, sushi in particular, like come to grips with like, what do I do with all this sushi that we have? Right. Like, do we, do we hold it and watch it go to 50% lower or do we, do we do something like hedge some way? Um, so there's a lot of that to going on right now, even with, uh, the rougher, the rougher investment mm -hmm. where they, they said that they were out in April, they made a billion dollars. They thought it got too insane. That was <laughs> very sold. smart of them. Yeah. Like yeah. good for them. You know, like we can't hate on that. We might want, everybody wants big money to come in, but big money is not always dumb money. It's most, most more often than not smart money. And they're going to, you know, take their profits in USD, right? Like that's the reality. Yep. It's true. Mike, any thoughts from you on 5K ETH flipping? Um, no, actually, I'm very much in line with Josh. Like, I think a flipping is also likely. Uh, but yeah, so the, the the main argument that no one will ever be able to kind of beat from Bitcoin is kind of like it was the first one. And as such, like the supply is like pretty, pretty uh, uh, spread out and decentralized in that sense. Where everything that came after is like a VC game, right? Even ETH was a VC game, right? Like they had a big ICO, right? Like... Uh, um, it was early days. It's different, different VCs and everything, and uh, different, different angels and such. So, uh, and and that's kind of you know, like and even right now, like not like if um, from a decentralization point of view, ETH is definitely not up to par with Bitcoin, right? Which is also which is the reason why it's been able to you know do the things that uh, uh, like it, it innovated, right? It innovated and and it moved fast. But yeah, at some point there might be something better comes along, right? Like it's quite likely that there will be some 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 better technology. There are a bunch of other change. Right now, they're all VC funded, so we'll kind of we'll have to see how far they get from that side. But like, there's there's heavy competition that Eve has, right? Like BSC is a good example here, right? Like, uh, which is uh, technically actually this, the under hood is the same technology, right? Is the e, it's the Eve software that is BSC. Um, yes, yeah, so that that's hard, right? Like, uh, if uh, because they are like the whole, the whole goal is like it's an open, accessible financial system for all kind of apps, and whenever you know things blow up, gas price becomes too high. Like, that's clearly not gonna work. But, uh, you know, with, with, with ETH 2.0, Layer 2, whatever, uh, if those things get traction, then yes, I think there will be flipping. It's very, very likely. Um, yeah, it's just like, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin really is, it's not really in the spotlight anymore, right? I mean, yeah, okay, sure, sure. like some countries take it up as, as, as legal tender. There's, there's some stuff here and there. But like, what, what has actually happened, you know? Like, so, so, so Lightning was in the works since like, you know, 2017, I think. Uh, late 17, maybe 2018. It's still kind of not being used by anyone. Uh, it's like, you know, it's only really the store of value argument here, right? There's, there's nothing else anymore. Like, so uh, I used to, you know, I, I watched Bitcoin uh, development in terms of like, you know, the the, the, the Bitcoin core software. It's like, all, all, all like I, I love what these guys are doing. They're, they're, they're working very hard. There's tons and tons of uh, development work being pushed out, but it's all about making the, 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 the node software that they have like more efficient and whatever, right? It's, there's, there's nothing is being added. Like they had a tap root, which is kind of like, you know, how long the years in the work, right? So from that perspective, right, I think there will be innovation uh, and innovation that will attract money as well and opportunity and stuff. And it will not be in Bitcoin, like most likely. That, 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 that's what, how it's looking like right now. From that perspective, there will be a flipping and ETH is a very likely candidate. But to ETH to 5K, yeah, I'm not sure. And not too good in price predictions there, but <laughs> that's not looking likely at the moment. Okay. All right. Do we have more um, viewer questions or listener questions, Paul? No, we don't. It has been a good run there, though, and um, very much enjoyed the the level of engagement from from the audience. And um, I'm sure we'll get more follow up questions on Twitter and uh, comments on the YouTube video as well. But um, yeah, thanks to, to everyone who has uh, posed questions there to our panelists. We appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah so before, before we wrap up and before we let you guys go, I want to ask you guys just one last question, which is share one alpha for this market for the listeners. What is one alpha you want to share for this market? How to, how to manage it? And whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Mike lead with that one. <laughs> uh, it, it's not really traditional alpha. Like I'm not really, uh, I think there's still tremendous opportunity if you're hungry and you want to spend time in terms of DeFi yields. So DeFi yields are a fraction of what they were. 
uh, there is still opportunity. Uh, uh, even uh, so this is not not your traditional alpha like buy this token or whatever, but like you know, <clears> there's arbitrage you can run on DeFi that's very profitable still. Uh, it's like you have to put in the work. Uh, this, this is kind of what. Uh, um, uh, so how, how I got started as well, but like in in terms of like uh, inefficiencies, there are plenty still. Uh, there, there, there's like you know uh, the, the saying is like there's no free lunch like there's lots of free lunch crypto but you have to put the time in that's kind of like you know as far as investment advice for for, for me would go uh, I don't really have any coin or something that I would kind of uh, uh, recommend right now I wouldn't even say like buy vol or like short vol or something like even that's tricky in this scenario um, yields are completely gone like you know I used to always recommend like do the cash and carry arbitrage or or, or something on a, on a centralized exchange. Right now, just, there's, there's no meat there, but in DeFi, there is still some. Just keep, keep looking. Uh, I guess my alpha would be to watch the CME rollover contracts. Um, the expiration dates is what I'm referring to. Historically, there's been a lot of volatility around those, and there has been, in the biannual contracts, basically a one-way street. And we're currently in the middle of a biannual contract that ends in September 24th. Currently, we've only been making lower lows in that contract. And if you go back since CME started in 2018, these biannual contracts have only had a one-way street for the most part, aside from uh, March. Now, without Corona, I'm pretty sure we still moon. Corona just delayed the moon. <laughs> um, because it looked like by all accounts we were ready to just blast off in uh, early Q2 2020, which is when crypto does the best anyway. But um, that got delayed until January 2021 for the most part. You know, it started in late Q4 uh, 2020. But anyway, watch those contracts. If if this contract that is rolling over next week, next week Friday, US time, if we open... Um, the next month's contract and we're still making lower lows you know i've i'm getting i get more and more bearish you know, if, if that 28th contract opens and we make lower lows we're still in backwardation like we are now on cme um you know you're just adding evidence to the bear pile you know and if you're if you're not seeing it that way you're in denial <laughs> so be prepared to, to eat some pain if uh if you don't see it that way Fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah. So we've got two interesting ideas there. Keep hunting for yields and keep an eye out on the bear pile, on the backwardation on CME and see where that goes. Right. And then, of course, do your own research. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. This is this is really cool. Yeah. Really Thanks. appreciate you both um, giving us so much insight there. That was uh, a, a really good call. And um, yeah, we'll have to have you both on again sometime. Um, hopefully, in a, a less bearish market or um, where there's some more positive uh, indications, maybe in the recovery at the other side of this, but um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So yeah, thanks everyone as well for tuning in. Um, you know, you're the the reason we turn up and um, kind of produce this, this content. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate everyone that has liked, subscribed, or commented already. If you haven't, we're at Going Elliptic on Twitter, and uh, we have Going Elliptic Substack uh, newsletter as well. But it's always yeah good to see a community building around um, kind of market analysis and content that's somewhat less hype driven. Um, we hope you've enjoyed today's show. Yeah, lots of good content. I, I really loved it. Just you know, two experts and just gave it um, their own organic perspective, right? Lots lots of great perspective, lots of good stuff. So, yeah, very thankful to both of them. Excellent. Well, until next time, um, you know, do keep an eye out uh, for the next piece of content we're going to produce, but uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future episode. So thanks, everyone.